Hey Joe, where are you going with that brush in your hand? Joe Sanja have been very generous to give me a sampling of their paints, thanks to a viewer who was very keen on them. I tried some stuff and learned some things, and now I want to share that with you. Though I am going to disclaimer this by saying that this is in no way a review. Paint is one of those things that I actually think is really hard to review because us artists work in different ways, which means we all have our preferences. So while I will give my observations and recommendations on what to get and how to work with them, it should still be up to you if it's something you're interested in. I won't go too in-depth into Joe Sanja history, but the basics are that Joe Sanja Jensen is an artist and teacher, and Joe Sanja's is an art studio in California. When we think of traditional artists, we think of canvas, but art done at the studio goes beyond canvas to pretty much anything. Wooden boxes, tableware and jugs, even clocks. So like I said, basically anything. Which meant that they needed a paint that could be painted on any surface but also have a strong permanent finish. And that's where Joe Sanja's matte flow acrylics come in. The basic idea behind them is that they contain more pigment to binder than traditional acrylics would. While normally artist grade paints have a 30% pigment to binder ratio at maximum, Joe Sanja's instead goes a little over that limit, having more pigment to less binder. What happens then is some of the acrylic properties mostly to do with its flexibility, are lost. Basically, if you were to roll up a canvas, paint it in acrylic, the paint would bend and flex with it. But since we paint on solid surfaces, it's not really an issue. That's also why we get away with being able to add water to our paints as miniature painters. While if you did that in an artist studio, you'd give the instructor a panic attack because you're messing with the properties of the acrylic binder. The more pigment in a paint, the more matte it becomes as well. So what we end up with are a matte paint with a strong pigment density that can paint on any surface. Sounds useful. With all that extra pigment in the paint, what's the benefit to us? Well, this is where it becomes interesting since we as miniature painters tend to put everything and anything into our paints. Water, medium, thinners, extender, future floor finish. And that's not even a joke on that last one. And every time we do, it thins out that pigment to binder ratio, which in turn makes the paints more transparent. It's why sometimes we struggle with thinning and transparency. We don't want our paints thick so they don't fill in the details, but we don't want them so thin that they don't cover either. With Joe Sanja's, as it's been told to me, the idea is to have a paint system where the assumption is something else is going into it, and so wanted to make sure paint stayed opaque the more additives were added. So while we could paint them out of the tube, that's not the intention. Not that we as mini painters ever do anyway. The paint itself comes in 2.5 ounce tubes, which is about 74 milliliters. For reference, Vallejo bottles are only 17 milliliters, and Liquitex are only 2 ounce. I will mention that the caps are thin, so don't allow them to be stood on end like Liquitex caps or bottles. But as someone in a dry climate that struggles with dried on caps, so far these ones haven't let the paint get into the threading at all, and have a good seal. They've given me six colors to work with, the primaries, white and black, and a brown, which is nice since browns are pretty difficult still with just the primaries. Also their magic medium, which I'll get to later, and some brush soap and conditioner. The consistency of the paints is a heavy body. It'll keep its shape right out of the tube, but it is quite easy to thin and mix with only a couple of colors that were as sticky as some of the thicker heavy bodies I use which means they shouldn't require too much effort to thin and mix. The labels indicate the name in many languages, the series, which is just used for pricing since professional lines like this price their paint based on pigments inside, not just per tube, as well as transparency information on the pigment itself, because even if it's filled with lots of pigment, that pigment itself has transparent properties, and on the back, 
light fast information, which we don't care about, and pigments used. Speaking of pigments used, the full line of paint has about 80 colors, including some single pigment paints and plenty of blends. Which means if you're more familiar with miniature paint lines, their lineup will be a bit more familiar as well, while still being possible to make a single pigment set from. I also didn't see anything that included cadmiums or cobalts, so there's nothing in the line we have to worry about avoiding for the most part. Black does have a warning, as well as anything with Pigment Black 7, but that's the exact same black you find in every black primer and miniature paint set, so unless you're really sensitive to it, it shouldn't be a problem to airbrush with. The other thing I was given was their Magic Mix which is a glaze and drying retarder in one. It's a little more fluid than the paint, but still quite viscous, and dries matte and clear. I struggle with dry climate, as I've mentioned before, so wanted to do a test to see how much more drying time the medium actually gives me. On the left is just one drop of water. On the right, one drop of the magic medium into approximately the same amounts of paint. The part we'll be concerned with most is the flattest parts of the paint, over about four to five minutes, you can see that the water was already dry and matte in those flat parts. While on the side of the medium, there were still a few wet spots in that flat area. As they dried, the water did dry a bit faster, so this will work to extend the working time, but mostly that working time will be at the start. It'll give a few extra moments to get those brush strokes on, but don't expect to be able to go back and blend more once it's down. Though looking at the finish, the one with the medium does seem to have more even coverage. But that could have been the brush. The best way to explore a paint line is to, you know, paint with it. So while I do have enough to mix and get a good number of hues with, I'm just going to go stick with the single colors to complete the model with for this video, and maybe do a mixing challenge with the primaries down the road. I'm going to start with the red, but since I have the brown, I'm going to use that instead of the black to get me my base coat color first. I'm going over top of a dark gray primer, so not quite black, and you'll see why as I paint this over the surface. For one, with just the magic mix in the paint, you can see it's really retained its viscosity. It didn't get watered down at all, so I did eventually have to add a bit of water myself. So as a medium, it's great if you don't actually want to change the structure of the paint, but do want to dilute out the pigments a bit, which is the glazing part. You might be able to also see what I meant earlier when talking about opacity. I'm having no problem covering this at all. It's going on nice and even and covering the primer layer. However, since red pigment is semi-transparent, as it dries, more of that black shows through, and we actually get a much darker red than it looks going on which is why I started with the dark gray instead of the pure black for a primer layer. I wasn't going to paint this in this way, but then I realized that it might be important to see how well they perform as washes. I think the medium will really help in this case as well, so I'll make a mix from the red, the medium, the blue, and the black. Not too much of those second two, since I do want to make sure the red is still the star of the show here. And lots of water. It goes on quite nicely, but the true measure of a wash is how it dries. So I'm just going to get this on quick and come back when it's dry. I didn't make the pigment all that dense, so it didn't change it too much. So I could have actually definitely done with more, but what I don't see is water stains or spots, which is the important part. Things dried evenly. So another coat or more paint in the solution next time, and I think they wash relatively well. When it comes to layering, I'm just going to use the red and the medium and a bit of water. I will mention at this point that this red blend seems more cool than a vibrant warm red, which is good for a mixing set, but if I wanted it more warm, I'd have to add a bit of the yellow. The high viscosity of the paint gives a lot of control with the brush, and the medium gives me a decent amount of time to work with it. But this is where we'll see the difference between a transparent pigment like this one and an opaque one in the next segment, because I can use a lot of this. And even though the pigment is dense, it still blends because much of what's under it shows through. So I can either paint a few layers with it, or do an opacity layer first by mixing in some white, and then go over it again with the red. 
With the brown, I want to show the difference with how the pigment density works between a transparent pigment and an opaque one in this set. For starters, with some black added to the brown, you'll see it covers really well, a one-coater almost, and dries pretty quickly in comparison. When it comes to layering, I can add a lot of this medium to it and it doesn't lose much or any of its opacity. So unlike with the red that needed a few coats to layer, with the more opaque brown, I'd actually have to add even more medium in order to get it to blend like it was with the red. So this is why those opacity labels are important, because they'll give a sense of what we need to add to the paint to get the effects we want. Also, I'm not going to be painting anything in black, but I do want to make the armor a dark black to start from instead of a dark gray when going with the blue. So you can see with this base coat just how opaque the black covers as well, which is why that white line is there, to actually show how it covers. With the blue, I want to show how these work with glazes. So I've skipped a few steps and I'm on to the last highlight. To work my way up, all I've been doing is adding white into the phthalo blue. Nothing else but the magic mix. Then I've been blocking in a layer to get the outline of the blue armor's layers. Once I've got it blocked in, I take some water and thin out the same color a little more, then whisk it from my bristles on a paper towel. The glazing happens by just using the damp brush to pull the thin pigments from the area surrounding where I blocked into, into the middle. As expected, it doesn't really have a problem with this, since most of the time we're adding so much water for glazes that it ends up being more liquid than binder. It does dry matte still though, so it is easy to see how this glazes once the layers dry. The last thing we might want to know about is how well they wet blend, since I tend to do a lot of that with loaded brush and classic wet blending. I've prepped for my wet blend by giving it a base coat of the brown and a layer of the yellow where I want to stripe along the gold that I'm aiming for. This is where the extender part of the medium has to play its role well. More pigment and less binder has an issue with drying fast usually. Though I haven't experienced that much of a difference between my standard use paint and Josanja's so far. But for wet blending, we want it wet, so I'm adding lots of medium and thinner to each color. I'm going with the opaque brown and the transparent yellow just to see if the transparency makes a huge difference. I tried the traditional wet blending first, adding the wet paint to the model and blending between them. At first it wasn't going as intended, as the paint I thought were thin enough still felt quite thick. So when I re-thinned them even more, then it worked a little bit more expectedly. However, one of the reasons I like heavy body is because they make for good loaded brush blending. So having something that can be thinned and in the bristles while having something else actually be a bit more thicker and sturdy makes for a nice loaded brush. The last thing I know people worry about is white, and everyone's gotten a bad one that was too thick and chalky. You know the one. In this case though, the white is the one that actually was easiest to thin for me and goes on quite nicely, blends nicely, and while it might be matte, doesn't dry chalky, as long as you're not leaving it on your wet palette overnight to use. So what makes this paint set something you might like? Well first off, it's a matte heavy body. There's not many of those out there, but those two words together are exactly what I like using. It has a dense pigment count at the cost of flexibility, which is something we don't care about as mini painters, which means they're great for use with mediums. Each tube has pigment information, which makes it very useful for mixing and knowing what's in your paint. Something that I briefly mentioned before was the cost. They do break the paints into price categories based on pigments used, but that doesn't mean they're expensive. Each Series 1 paint is a little under $5 US for 74 milliliters of paint. That's equal to roughly four and a third bottles of a lot of miniatures brand paint bottles. And lastly, and I think this one is mostly just important to me, but even though the lineup of paints contain a lot of blends, they still have almost every single pigment paint you want yellow oxide, all the pigment brown sevens, phthalo green and blue, but also some convenience mixes like skin tones and grays. If you want to just test them out for yourself, they have a little set that I think would be the best way to start, and that's this color mixing set. The tubes are smaller at only 20 milliliters, though that's still plenty for us mini painters, 
and you get a large range of vibrant colors with color wheels. Plus the container it comes in can be used as a wet palette if you can get yourself a sponge and some parchment paper. The one thing I didn't mention at all was the brush soap and conditioner. And that's because, well, I'm a heretic and I don't like using brush soap. Any brush soap. I find they ruin more brushes than they've saved. Not this one particularly. I'm sure if you like brush soaps, it'll work just fine. But there's something about them that have just never worked for me, and I always end up with a worse point than I started with. So I just wasn't going to chance it on any of my good brushes. So this is going to have to be the one thing you test for yourself. Please subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this one, or just other fun things to do with painting miniatures. And until next time, enjoy your own painting journey.